Well, hello there, everyone. Welcome back to English with Catherine. It's been a whole seven days, has it? I think so. Now, I have to be honest with you, I'm quite tired this morning and I was trying to get my eyes to open with as much mascara as possible. <laughs> also, filming on the other side today, which has completely thrown me. I've just behaved like quite a diva to Tom uh, about it because it feels quite weird to me. But anyway, the text is now gonna be on this side of me rather than on this side. I would really appreciate your feedback about if that's easier for you or if that's kind of annoying. So let me know in the comments. We're going to be exploring in detail what it means to sound like an English rose. And I'll tell you now, it's not what you're thinking. So let's start with how I feel about roses. I'm just really drawn to roses. My favourite is probably the peach pink coloured roses, they're just beautiful. Depending on the season, you can usually find me wandering around an ancient rose garden in a National Trust property. Let me tell you about National Trust. This is kind of like a charity organisation which you can have a membership for. Basically, the National Trust looks after and conserves old properties in the UK. So you can make a donation or you can have a membership. My mum and dad have a membership and they go all the time. And they just have the most stunning houses, castles, places that need to be preserved and looked after properly. Usually there's an old rose garden. There's just something about the rose. It's romantic, but it's also classic, timeless, elegant. For centuries, women have been compared to roses. If you take the English rose, for an example, there's a reason why we use the rose and not another completely different beautiful flower. That's because the rose is actually the national flower of England. And also the Tudor rose is a very important emblem that sort of represents our history. And this symbolized the union at the end of the War of the Roses. And it's still used in English heraldry, even to this day, as well as just generally used to represent England. And I've actually got a Tudor kind of rose inside my logo that Tom designed. It's right here, actually. <laughs> now, the stereotype of an English rose is actually a very beautiful woman, but she's natural. Okay, so she's got this natural quality about her. Arguably, this is not really that complimentary to women this comparison in that way, because it's kind of just about looks, beauty, which is only skin deep. But I want to challenge this stereotype today. I want to talk about different qualities of the rose that we can all aspire to be compared to. The qualities other than beauty, they're very resilient. They can survive even the most harshest frosts. They have thorns along their stem to protect them, I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of the thorns are, but they really hurt if you scratch yourself on them. <laughs> and because of this resilience and strength, it kind of gives them this timeless quality, a kind of elegance and effortless charm. And this makes the rose a wonderful role model for everyone, men and women. So we can all be more like the rose. And I'm gonna show you how in this video. Now, to give you an example of the ultimate English rose, it's got to be Princess Diana. She was famously referred to as England's Rose in Elton John's song, Candle in the Wind, which was released just after she died. And she couldn't be a better example of what I'm trying to explain to you. Yes, she was beautiful, externally, but she also had this elegance, this resilience, Today's video is going to be about what to say. So the content of your speech. This is not so much about accent. This is more about behavior and character, strength of character, being considerate, kind, compassionate, empathetic, and elegant. Just an overall great human being. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. Let's get started. Number one, how to be empathetic. What you're trying to do is relate to the person you're talking to. Even if you haven't had necessarily the same experience as the person you're talking to, you can still act empathetic, which shows that you want to understand and relate to the person as much as you can. 
This just helps to decrease the social distance between you, bring you closer together, create a really nice energy between you. It also helps you to be more likeable as a person because the listener or whoever you're talking to will really appreciate the effort that you're putting in just to make them feel more comfortable. How do we do this? We use a little word and that's must. When you're talking to someone and they're telling you about something that happened in the past and you're really sure about how they felt in that moment, what we do is we say, that must have been. Oh, that must have been awful for you. Poor you. That must have been really challenging. Or if they're telling you something positive that happened in the past, of course you can say, that must have been amazing. That must have been wonderful. One of the best experiences of your life. If whatever the person is telling you is happening right now and continuing, we say must be. For example, my friend who's going through the process of selling her house and buying a new house is pretty stressful. When she calls me up and she tells me and vents to me about this, I just say, oh, that must be really hard. Poor you. That must be really, really stressful and challenging. I'm struggling to find other words other than stressful and challenging. Let's try and think. Difficult, awful. If you want to reference how they are feeling in that moment, you can say, you must be feeling. You must be feeling really fed up. Now that means really frustrated. Number two, be considerate delivering bad news. Now, no one likes to feel shocked like the rug has been pulled out from underneath them. By the way, that's an expression. If the rug is pulled out from beneath you, it's when something happens completely out of the blue that you were not expecting. For example, you hear some really bad news or something shocking that you weren't expecting. You want to try to prepare the person before you say something potentially disappointing so that they don't have that feeling of <gasps> And how do we do this? Well, we can use I'm afraid. We can also use unfortunately. And what this does is it stops you from sounding too abrupt, too direct. I was talking in my previous video about British etiquette. We like to soften things. And really, if you think about why we're doing this, it's so that the listener feels more comfortable. We're always thinking about the person. You can say, unfortunately, I can't come to your party. I'm really, really sorry. Or, I'm afraid I can't do that favor for you anymore. I'm so sorry. So use unfortunately and I'm afraid to prepare the person or the people you're talking to for some disappointment. Number three, filling silences. Now we do have a, a reputation, I'm sure you know, as being quite awkward people, the British. We get really uncomfortable with silences. There's actually a reason for that. When you fill silences, you're actually taking the pressure off the listener again, or whoever you're talking to, because you're basically showing them that they don't need to speak. They don't need to think of something to say because you're going to fill the silence for them. Because what we want to achieve is a lovely, smooth, flowing conversation that just sounds like music and doesn't have any breaks where neither of you know what to say. So what we use is fillers. And these are quite often soft sounding little words that help to fill little gaps in conversation. So the fillers you can use are, um, um, you know, this creates good energy and flow. Because imagine if you were listening to a song and it kept stopping and starting and stopping and starting. It would be really annoying, right? <laughs> Number four sound interesting and engaging. Now, this one is again about how you come across. You want to come across as interesting and sort of exciting and not just boring and dull. Because again, you want the listener or the person you're talking to to enjoy your company and not want to make an excuse to leave. So to help you sound a bit more interesting, we can use idioms. And I think that's why people are so interested in idioms and proverbs and expressions, because they make you sound different. They make you sound a bit more engaging. If you use the language creatively, it's always going to have a good effect 
on whoever you're talking to. I mean, have you ever questioned why we like idioms? I mean, I like them for the history and the etymology of the words and the language, but I also like using them with people because it's just a bit more exciting than just the regular English language, which, if you took away the idioms and expressions, would be pretty dull. And as a rose, you also want to give off an allure of magic and mystery, and using some whimsical expressions will really help to achieve that. For example, instead of using a boring time expression like 20 years ago or 100 years ago, we can use back in the day. Back in the day, we would eat cucumber sandwiches on the lawn. <laughs> okay, no, you're probably not going to say that. It's just a bit more beautiful and interesting. And another example is a whimsical idiom, a storm in a teacup. I love this idiom. It just means a situation where everyone is really angry and uh, complaining about something that's actually very trivial and small. <laughs> so it's a storm in a teacup. For example, the whole controversy turned out to be a storm in a teacup. A big fuss over nothing. Okay, one more because you know I love this subject. Have you ever heard of the expression earworm? An earworm, you know like the worms, the slithery horrible things? Well an earworm is actually a melody that's stuck in your head. You know when you hear a song on the radio and it's really catchy and you just can't get it out of your head? Sometimes you really want it <laughs> to get out of your head because it's a really bad song, but uh, sometimes a lovely melody just gets stuck and that's called an earworm. And fun fact for you, did you know that scientists have named the most addictive earworm and it is We Will Rock You by Queen. <laughs> I wonder if you agree, do you think that's really catchy? I think it is. I think that was stuck in my head for about a month at one point. <laughs> I just love the creativity of that expression. I mean, it's not the nicest thing to imagine having a worm in your head, but just the fact that it's about a melody that won't leave your head. It's just really clever. <laughs> so that's the end of the video, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching if you made it to the end of the video. Hit subscribe if you feel like it. I would love to have you on board. And of course, stay tuned for part two of this video, which is going to be more about sound, okay? So I'm gonna give you some tips on tone of voice and how to sound more like an English rose. I hope also that you understood what this video is really about and how anyone can be more like the rose. It's got nothing to do with being English. So really the video should be how to sound like a rose. I'll see you next Friday for another video. Have a lovely weekend. Bye.